in Matthew chapter 5. We started last week with an uh, introduction to the Sermon on the Mount. We said this is the most famous sermon in the world. Um, there are parts of it that are misunderstood, and so we looked at a, a basic introduction to talk about it. And just to give you a quick review, we said that when we come to this, there's so much history, uh, there's poetic imagery that goes into the Sermon on the Mount. Because Deuteronomy 18 prophesied a prophet like Moses that would come, and that's Jesus. And what did Moses do? He went up on Mount Sinai and received uh, God's law for the people. Well, Jesus comes, and he goes up on the mountain, and he's not just, he is the prophet like Moses, but he's not only that, he is God himself, God the Son, come in human flesh. And he's not, uh, he, he reveals to the people the, the, what God wants them to do. It's just as Moses was there speaking to Israel, well now, here is Jesus, and he's speaking not only to Jews, but to Jews and Gentiles who are coming to follow him. This is what we would call the Israel of God, that the Bible refers to. And we'll say more about that later, Lord willing. We said that it's interesting because in the Old Testament, whenever Moses went up on the mountain, the people, they were afraid, and they said, basically, we can't bear to hear the voice of God or see his fire. We're going to die. And yet Jesus comes as what? The word and as the light of the world. And they are able to see him and able to hear him and take him in. And we said that the purpose of this sermon was, first of all, to show disciples their position. He's going to tell them, this is who you are. And remember that Matthew is writing to um, Jewish folks who have come to believe in, in Jesus. Many of Matthew's hearers are Jewish folks who have come to believe in Jesus and are being ostracized by the religious community, by the community of those people around them. So he wants them to know their position. Um, also, he wants them to see the disciples practice. This is what it means to be a, a member, a citizen of the kingdom of God. This is how we live. Then he also is showing the crowds the provision of salvation by faith. And we notice the distinction as it starts out in Matthew 5, that there's the crowds, but then there's the disciples. And it's the disciples that come up to hear him teach. But somehow the crowds either overhear him or, or trickle up or are kind of in the background listening because um, the Sermon on the Mount closes out with kind of an invitation and talks about the crowd's response to hearing Jesus teach. So he said that as we come to this sermon, remembering that in the Old Testament, the people couldn't even hear, couldn't bear to hear the voice of God or to see the fire. And now here comes Jesus, the word, the light, and he sits down to teach. And they're able to sit down. We should come to this sermon with awe. And so we begin the very first part of the sermon, the Beatitudes, it's often called the Beatitudes. Now, maybe you wonder, what is a Beatitude? Because it sounds different than the way it's spelled. If you were a child, maybe you'd think it's a bee with an attitude. What is the, what's the deal here? Well, that's, it's a different thing. Um, so the word Beatitude, I'll just give this to you, just a name that's been ascribed to this section of Michael J. Wilkins' writing and designing with an illustrated Bible backgrounds commentary explains the name beatitude is derived from the Latin noun beatitudo because the first word of each statement in the Latin Vulgate is beati, I hope I said that right, um, it's an adjective related to the noun, which translates the Greek word makurios, which traditionally is rendered in English as blessed. So if you ever wonder where in the world do we come up with any beatitudes, that's where it came from. But here we go, Mark chapter 5. Let's read verses 1 through 12. And our plan today is just to give an introduction to the Beatitudes, to look at some of what they, how they function and how it's structured. And then Lord willing, in the weeks to come, we'll begin working through these uh, one at a time and applying them to our lives. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the lowly, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you 
and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Well, as we come to these Beatitudes, I want to give you, tell you what each Beatitude contains. Let me just go ahead and give this to you, and then we'll actually work through um, step by step what I'm about to say to you. But the quick overview is this each Beatitude is going to contain, first of all, a pronouncement of blessing, a product of faith in Jesus, a peril that is faced as a believer in Jesus, and then a promise of blessing, okay? Uh, first of all, a pronouncement of blessing. This speaks of the status of a believer. You notice each one of those starts out blessed, 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 or blessed, okay? Blessed. This is the status of of the believer. And remember, we just said, but to remind ourselves again, some of these disciples that Matthew is writing to, they're being told, hey, you're not really a Jew, you're not really part of the community, we're not going to have anything to do with you, because they've come to follow Jesus. And in some sense, they may feel cursed. And Jesus says, and Matthew records for them to hear, no, you're blessed. You're blessed. All right? Um, this word blessed, it's a bit of a complicated thing, and I spent a lot of time this week just focusing on this word and trying to dig through what does he mean, what does he not mean, and we'll try to unpack some of this for you. The Amplified Bible defines blessed as spiritually prosperous, happy to be admired. All right? Uh, the CSB Study Bible says, puts it this way. I, the CSB Bible just knocked it out of the park. It says this. Makarios occurs 30 times in the Gospels, all but two on the lips of Jesus. So every time it occurs, Jesus is speaking other than uh, uh, two other times in the Gospels. Um, the Old Testament Hebrew term, Ashri, stands behind the New Testament usage, usage, uh, usage of Makarios. Both terms are normally translated blessed or happy. Makarios has two main nuances in the New Testament. So anywhere this word gets used in the New Testament, it's usually used one of two ways. Here they are. It's used predominantly, excuse me, predominantly refers to God's blessing upon his people, which is how we're seeing it used here. It's God's blessing upon his people. But the second use, secondarily, to God's people blessing him. In the latter sense, makarios is basic, basically synonymous with praise. Okay, So it gets used whenever God is blessing a person or whenever we bless God, we praise God. When a person is blessed by God, he is approved by God. The opposite of makarios is woe. The status of one who is not approved by God and is thus the object of impending judgment. God's blessing does not necessarily include material prosperity in this life. The contrary is actually quite possible. But it does anticipate full undirected prosperity in the future kingdom. Now, I know that's a mouthful. We'll slow it down some. Some of this will become more clear as we go on. But first of all, blessed just means that God is pleased with the believer. It's his stamp of approval on them. Second thing is this. This blessing is true, even if it doesn't look like it. Even if it doesn't look like it. Because there are times in our life, uh, for instance, that are mentioned here, times of persecution, times of mourning. And from our perspective, it may not look like our life is very blessed at that moment. But God is giving us his perspective. You are blessed. You are approved. Um, and so we need eyes of faith for this. The next thing is this. It goes hand in hand. This blessing is true even if it doesn't feel like it. Even if it doesn't feel like it, but believing it can help us feel it. All right? If you're going through the midst of this deep hardship that is mentioned in the Beatitudes, if you're going through one of those circumstances, it's hard to see that you're blessed. You may not feel blessed. I mean, the word gets translated blessed or even happy. You're like, I don't feel very happy right now. This is not a happy circumstance. Nevertheless, it is true that in that we are blessed, approved by God. And when we realize that, 
when we go to these scriptures and go, wow, this is what God says of me right now. Then when we believe that, then sometimes our emotions catch up. So even in the midst of deep sadness over some hurt we may be experiencing, we can still be happy in the fact that God is pleased with us. God has put his stamp of approval on us. He says we are blessed. We're blessed um, according to him. In this fallen world, sometimes this is the way it works. There's deep sorrow over um, maybe our own sin, but we're considered blessed because we're poor in spirit. We're repentant before him. Or maybe there's deep sorrow because of a wrong being done to you. Maybe someone's lied about you. That's one thing that's mentioned here. Maybe there's persecution. And there's deep sorrow over someone's sin. And yet there's happiness that you know God says you're approved. You're blessed and great is your reward in heaven. All right? Uh, the next thing is this. This blessing is true even when we are not aware of it. But God wants us to know it. Consider some of the original hearers, readers of Matthew, who are enduring some of this kind of persecution. that have been ostracized by their families who have not come to faith in Jesus yet. And they don't feel very well. They, they may have been, because of their old way of thinking, they may be thinking, oh, these rough things are happening in my life. God must be mad at me. No. According to Scripture, God's not mad at them at all. God considers them blessed, Right? And remember, Matthew has set us up for this moment because he talked about the baptism of Jesus. This is my son with whom I am well pleased. And right after, the same spirit that descends in approval on Jesus at the baptism like a dove is the same spirit that then leads him to the wilderness, right? But the wilderness and the temptation there reveals that what has been said about him at the baptism is true. This is the Son of God. He is well pleasing to the Father. And so this blessing is true, even when we may we not be aware of it, may not be aware of it, but God wants us to be aware of it. That's why he's included it in his word. And perhaps it is good for us in the midst of deep trial, in the midst of persecution, to come and just read these words and to hear what God says is true of us. Maybe there's someone in your life that needs this encouragement. Maybe there's someone who's really going through it. And you need to take them through these verses and say, listen, this is what God says of you. He says you're blessed. Next thing is this. Jesus' use of the word blessed points again to him being the Deuteronomy 18 prophesied prophet like Moses and the church being the Israel of God. Okay? The fact that he uses this word again points to the fact that he's a fulfillment of the Deuteronomy 18 prophecy of a prophet like Moses and that these believers, the church, are, are part of what we would call the Israel of God. And we'll unpack that because there's certainly still a future for physical Israel, right? The reason I say his use of that word points to this whole theme of the Deuteronomy 18 thing is this. The only time the Septuagint, we talked about that last week, the Septuagint was the Greek translation of the Old Testament. It's the one we see some of the New Testament writers quoting. The only time the Septuagint uses the word blessed to translate something Moses said was in Deuteronomy 33.29. It should be there in your notes, but I want to read you Deuteronomy 33.29. Blessed are you, O Israel, who is like you, a people saved by Yahweh, who is the shield of your help and the sword of your majesty, so your enemies will cower before you and you will tread upon their high places. Now, we're going to come back to this passage a little later, Lord willing. But for right now, this is pointing out again the identity of the people. Moses blesses Israel. Blessed are you, O Israel. And he goes on to explain. And now Jesus is here saying to the Israel of God, blessed are you. Their identity is being hammered home. They are part of the Israel of God mentioned in Galatians 6.16. We looked at that last week. They are circumcised in heart, Romans 2.29. This is not what's called replacement theology. There's a, there's a theology out there that says that, that Israel has been replaced by the church. We don't believe that because the book of Romans, chapter 11, verse 25 to 27, tells us that there is still a future for the people of Israel. We think this happens in the tribulation, that there will come a time whenever all physical Israel that's alive at that time 
will repent, come to believe in Jesus as Messiah, and become part of the true spiritual Israel of God. All right? Um, number two, these Beatitudes, they're, they each list a product of faith in Jesus. A product of faith in Jesus. Okay? So there's the position, you're blessed, and the next thing in each of them is a product of faith in Jesus. And these are signs of faith in the life of the believer. Uh, poor in spirit, those who mourn, and the idea can be there you're mourning your sin or someone else's sin. Um, you're lowly, you're hungry and thirst for righteousness. You're merciful, you're pure in heart, you're a peacemaker, you're enduring persecution. All of these are evidences of faith. They're products of faith. Um, just go down through the list here. Oh, I can get, my, get ahead of myself. Sorry. They're a product of faith in Jesus. So, first thing underneath that is this. These character traits that are listed are manifestations, not merits. Okay? Manifestations, not merits. In other words, these things don't save you. We're not saved by our works. We're not saved by being humble or by being merciful. But no, we're saved by faith in Jesus who kept the law for us and died as our substitutionary sacrifice on the cross, was risen and ascended, is coming back again. When we call upon his name for salvation of help, I can't save myself, please save me. He saves us. But if we have that saving faith and thus are made new creations in Christ, these things that he lists are to be true in our life. They're evidences, they're manifestations, they're expressions of faith. The next thing is this. Each of these traits is a matter of the heart. Each of these is a matter of the heart. And they make their way to the outside, but they're all a matter of the heart. Poor in spirit, mourn, lowly, or some of your translations say, may say meek or, or humble. We hunger and thirst for righteousness. We're merciful, pure in heart. That even has it in the, in the phrase. Um, peacemakers. You're peacemakers because you have peace in your heart and you're longing for that. And it, for those who are persecuted in your heart, you've set Christ as king, and you're willing to endure persecution for him. So each of these things that is listed in the Beatitudes, it's a, it's a trait of the heart. God always wants our heart. Speaking of heart, the next thing is this. Each of these traits represent the actions of Jesus and thus reveal his heart. They represent the actions of Jesus and thus represent his heart. Poor in spirit. Jesus didn't have anything to be repentant of to be poor in spirit, but he was certainly poor in spirit as far as enduring the things around him. Remember, uh, oh, unbelieving generation, how long will I be with you? He said at one point. Uh, those who mourn, remember how he wept over Jerusalem? Blessed are the lowly or the meek, the humble. Jesus was certainly that. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, well, he's righteousness incarnate, right? Um, the merciful, pure in heart, peacemakers. And part of being a peacemaker, we see this in the life of Jesus, is sometimes means confrontation. And we see that as he seeks to bring peace to the people, but must confront the, the false religious authorities in, in the process. And certainly he was persecuted for righteousness' sake. Each of these things represents the heart of Jesus. And so the point is, when we live these out in the world, we're being like him. We're speaking the words of the word. We're shining the light of the light. In fact, this word blessed here is a term that is also used of God. We mentioned that earlier, but this points, and I'm going to try, try to tie this together for you to see how it points to Jesus and us being like him. In 1 Timothy um, chapter 1 and verse 11, it says this, According to the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. And then in chapter 6 of 1 Timothy, that's the same book, chapter 6 and verse 15. Here's my page to turn. It says this, which he will bring about at the proper time, he who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords. So we praise him. We consider him blessed. But he also says of the believers here who are living out their faith that they are blessed. We're being like him. 
want to read you something Dwight Pentecost wrote in a book called The Words and Works of Jesus Christ, The Study of the Life of Christ. He says this, the Greek word translated blessed occurs frequently in the New Testament. And he lists some references. The Greeks used this word to describe the condition of their gods. Now that's small god, small g, little g, false gods. The Greeks used this word to describe the condition of their gods who were deemed to be satisfied because they had everything they possessed without limitation. When our Lord, however, spoke of happiness, he related it to holiness. So the Greeks used the word to describe their gods saying, well, they got everything they want without limitation, so they're blessed. And he says, this is not the way Jesus used it. Anytime Jesus used the word, he says, when our Lord, however, spoke of happiness, blessed, he related it to holiness. Happiness and holiness are inseparable in his kingdom. Okay? In other words, for a believer, there can be no true spiritual happiness unless you're living out the holiness that you've been declared to have in Jesus. So these things, these products that are listed in the Beatitudes, these products of faith, are again, represent the actions of Jesus and thus his, in his heart. And it's only in living out our identity as Christians, little Christs, being like him, walking in holiness, only in that is true spiritual happiness uh, realized. The Christian life, we've said this before, doesn't work unless there's full surrender, total surrender, Nothing held back. It's the only way to have true peace in your heart if you're a Christian. That's the way it's designed to work. He is Lord. And that means that what he says go, goes. But what he says is for our good and his glory. Well, the next thing is this. Each parable, excuse me, each parable, each beatitude has a peril faced in faith in Jesus. Okay? These speak of the suffering believers face in the fallen world. So he tells you your position. He tells you the product of faith that we have. And then he also tells you of the peril that we face as believers. We'll go down through the list very quickly. In verse 3 it says, uh, we're poor in spirit. Well, that would be because of our sin or the sin of others or just the suffering of living in a fallen world. In verse 4 it talks about mourning. This could be because of something sad has happened. That's why we mourn. Either our sin or someone else's sin or just stuff that happens in a fallen world that's sad. If we're lowly, it is implied that there are the proud and the arrogant of the world with which, with which we sometimes have to interact. Uh, for those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, this implies a need for it. We live in a world that's not righteous. It's unrighteous in many ways. It's sinful. When it talks about mercy... Uh, this implies that there's someone who needs to be shown mercy, someone who's wronged us, or someone who's wronged someone else. If we are pure in heart, it also, again, implies that there are other people in the world that are not pure in heart. If we are peacemakers, it implies that there are warmongers at worst among us, or, at best, some sort of misunderstanding that needs to be straightened out. When it talks about being persecuted for the righteousness, it, of course, implies that there are those who are persecuting us. There are those that are lying about us. So make no mistake, when the Bible says we're blessed, blessed, that doesn't mean that in the here and now everything's easy. <laughs> if you ever turn on the TV and there's a preacher on there telling you that if you believe in Jesus, you're just going to have a bunch of money and fame and you'll always be healthy, turn the channel. He's wrong. Jesus is very straightforward that life in a fallen world, you are blessed by him, yes, but there is pain that we endure in this world. But it's in the darkness of these perils that the brightness of the believer shine, right? When someone has deeply wronged you and they're expecting wrath, but instead you show them mercy. What a beautiful thing. And how that can be used to draw them to Christ. When someone is pressuring you to cave in your faith and they're persecuting you or lying about you and you don't cave but you stand for righteousness. The beauty of truth stands out. And you can go on down the list. 
when we mourn, but we do it in a godly way. We mourn as those who have hope. It stands out and it shines in the darkness of this fallen world. You can go down to the list with me. When someone sees that you're pure in heart, that you really just genuinely love them because they're created by God and Jesus died for them and you just love them. There's not some sort of an angle you're going for. You're not trying to use them, but it's just a genuine love. There's a pureness of heart there that shines in the darkness of a world where people try to use each other. But in this world, we will suffer. 2 Timothy 3.12 says, Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But again, just to repeat this, Matthew wants his readers and us to know that just because we face hardship, sorrow, or persecution, or even being lied about, whatever it is, those things doesn't mean, they don't mean that God is mad at you. It's a fallen world. You're his ambassadors, and you are considered blessed by him. These things that we experience in the wilderness show on the outside what God knows to already be true of us on the inside. Well, the fourth thing about these is each one contains a promise of blessing. And these speak of the stability of the believers. Of believers. Each one tells them um, about their stability as believers. So you're seeing the progress here. Here's your position. Here's a product of your faith. Here's a peril you're facing. But here is the promise of your security in Christ. Now, to look at this, because each one contains this, right? Uh, you could go down to the list. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. For they shall be comforted. They shall inherit the earth. But they shall be satisfied. They shall receive mercy. They shall see God. They shall be called sons of God. Um, the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Uh, your reward in heaven is great. All of these things. But to look at this, I want us to compare this first of all with Deuteronomy 33. 29 again and compare that with the structure of the Beatitudes okay so the first thing is this in both of them the people have been delivered by God watch this in Deuteronomy 33 29 it starts out blessed are you O Israel who is like you a people saved by Yahweh so this is they are blessed and they have been saved. They've been delivered. There's been this past action that brings current blessing in their life, right? They're blessed, and they've been, they've been delivered. So their deliverance, I guess you could say, is kind of proof of their blessed status here. They're blessed. They have been delivered by God. Well, in the same way, the Beatitudes start out, blessed are. And that word implies that there's a relationship with God. And that there's fellowship with God. That we've called upon his name for salvation. And we are walking in faith with him now. The second thing is this. It shows that the people are dependent on God. Dependent on God. The next part of Deuteronomy 33, 29 says this. Who is the shield of your help and the sword of your majesty. And just as ancient Israel was dependent on the Lord to be their sword and shield. So we are dependent on the Lord in our spiritual fight, right? But we're dependent on his strength and power, his wisdom and knowledge as we seek to show his love to the world. In fact, Ephesians 6 says that we've been given the shield of faith and the sword of the spirit by which we wage war. Next thing is this, the people are destined by God. They're destined by God. Romans 33, 29 goes on to say, so your enemies will cower before you and you will tread upon their high places. Just as ancient Israel was promised victory in the promised land, so the people of God, the Israel of God, the church, has been promised victory in the age to come. And that leads us to the next thing, the already not yet. We've talked about this expression before. The already not yet. Already in Jesus, the kingdom has come near, but not yet do we see it here in full. 
So for example, in Deuteronomy 33, 29, Moses referred to Israel's past deliverance from Egypt, their present reliance on God, and their future victory in the promised land. Here in Matthew, Jesus, the prophet like Moses, uh, he's addressing those who are part of the Israel of God, and he says that, they, that they've already been delivered from the kingdom of darkness. Okay, that's Colossians 1.13 talks about this. You and I have already been delivered from the kingdom of darkness. We've been transferred to the kingdom of the sun. As he talks to them, they are currently relying on God's sovereignty and power, on his knowledge and wisdom, to live out his love in the world. And there is a future victory awaiting for them when the kingdom comes in full. All right? Now, I want us to look at the verbs and how they're used in this passage. Because you're going to find some things that are present, current, when he speaks to them, and then there are other things that are future. Notice the present tense, and first of all, in verse Three, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's present tense. Let's get down to verse 10. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's current. And look at verse 12. For your reward in heaven is great. Okay? So if you have placed your faith in Jesus... You are already part of the kingdom, regardless of whatever else you may be going through right now. You are part of that kingdom. And as you suffer for your faith, already there is reward being stored up in heaven for you. You already have reward waiting for you there. It's a current thing. That's present tense. But there is also future tense. With that last thing, it's like, the rewards you presently have them in heaven, but you won't see them until the future, right? But there is present tense or future tense here as well. Because look at verses four through nine. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall, that's future, be comforted. Blessed are the lowly, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. That's future tense. Now, as we go through them one by one, you'll see that the future can apply two ways. Number one, some of these things are going to be future in their lifetime. Okay? For example... Uh, we know from first, excuse me, Second Corinthians chapter one that when we suffer, God says He will comfort us. Okay, so you may be suffering, but there is comfort coming. So sometimes what He promises here in the Beatitudes in the future part is future within their lifetime. Other times it may be that it's in eternity that they see these things, and the future is in eternity. Sometimes it's kind of like you get some of it now. And some of it in eternity, all right? So um, we said a bit more clear. Let's say you're suffering. God does comfort those who mourn. So that is, you, there will be comfort coming to you. But in this life, there are some pains so deep that the total comfort won't come till eternity. Hope that makes sense, all right? When you go through deep loss of a loved one, God will comfort you, yes. But that wound may in some sense always be there until you're at home with him. All right? Or let's say um, there's some sort of betrayal in your life. Someone wounds you. There are certain wounds that though, yes, God will comfort you. There are certain wounds that are so deep that it may be eternity until they're fully healed. Even though you forgive that individual. All right? Um, so these things are part of the already not yet kingdom. Here's the comforting thing in remembering this already not yet principle and the promise of the reward that's coming. When everything around us may be shaking, we need to remember that we're part of a kingdom that can't be shaken. Hebrews 12, 28 to 29 says this, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude 
by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. And we're back to that imagery from the mountain. Read that again. We, therefore, since we are receiving, so already not yet, already it's here, but not yet here full, we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken. Let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. And these character traits, these products of faith that are mentioned in the attitudes, I think certainly qualify here as an acceptable service being offered to God with reverence and all. So have you placed your faith in Christ? And as a believer, are you seeking to live submitted to him, living out your citizenship of that kingdom in this current world while we wait for the kingdom to come full? And God says, you're blessed. Let's let that sink in. The Almighty God says, you're blessed. Even when the world may not approve of you, you're approved by Him. Even when it may feel like you're going through some sort of curse, God says, no, you're blessed. This very thing that seems like a curse that seems like it's taking away so much from you, if you could only see the rewards that are being stored up in heaven as you follow in faith in the midst of such loss. This is an opportunity for you. That's God's perspective. And we're blessed. So, may we live fully surrendered to the King now as we wait for the not yet. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you that we can be part of your kingdom, that you didn't leave us to die, but you came to die for us so that we could be transferred from the kingdom of darkness to your kingdom, the kingdom of light. Thank you that we who were cursed because of our sin, that we're the same ones you came for and you were cursed for on the cross. You were crowned with the thorns that were part of the curse for our sin. You bore our curse so that now you, the blessed one, look at us and say, we are blessed. Lord, may that humble us and may it stir us up to service all at once. Thank you.